Uh, thank you, Shaja. Uh, yes, so hi everyone. Thank you for joining my talk. Uh, and yeah, my name is Mirsha Kodak. I'm a grad student at CMU. And today I'll be presenting our work on how to make deep nets more efficient using factorized layers, which is joint work with Neil Tenenholtz, Lester Mackey, and Nicola Fuzzi of MSR. So in the past decade, machine learning methods have made enormous progress on many classical AI tasks, such as game playing, translation, image classification, and more recently, they've even given promising advances on some of these hard scientific tasks, such as protein folding and solving partial differential equations. Uh, and the main drivers of this progress have been neural networks, which are models in which data is passed through several layers of matrix multiplications and nonlinear functions before outputting a label or other prediction. Uh, and these models are popular because they're flexible and they're easy to train using simple algorithms, for example, gradient descent. It's also very easy to make neural networks more expressive, which means uh, capable of modeling many different functions. Uh, by increasing the number of layers or the sizes of these matrices. Uh, so these matrices uh, that um, apply to the inputs and then are passed through nonlinearity. And in fact, researchers have found this to be so uh, effective for accuracy uh, that modern state-of-the-art methods look more like this, where each of these little red boxes can correspond to millions of parameters each. And you have uh, many more of them than even I can uh, fit in in this uh, compressed picture. So as kind of examples of this, uh, most dramatic examples, at least, there's Google's uh, BITP, which is a computer vision model, which has uh, 928 million parameters, and it's trained on uh, huge amounts of images. Uh, and this is an animation of what it uh, looks like, uh, which at least tries to show its scale. Uh, and a very famous example is this GPT-3 language model from OpenAI, which has 125 billion parameters. Uh, and it's very recent, and it's now being applied to, uh, you know, such as a startup, for example, to fix your emails. Uh, since we're bad at writing them. Um, and this corresponds to uh, 700 uh, gigabytes of uh, model parameters, which uh, no reasonable uh, application can easily store in RAM. Uh, and so while such model sizes are great for accuracy, they also cause massive headaches for engineers. Um, they're difficult to deploy on uh, edge devices, such as cell phones or cars. Uh, even, in, even when used in servers, they take up a lot of compute and energy uh, when you want to make predictions. Uh, and training these models is basically impossible unless you're a large corporation and your data is all in one place. So in settings as federated learning uh, or even uh, you know, academic settings, it's very hard to train these models uh, from scratch. Uh, and to solve this uh, problem, uh, there's been a lot of recent work on model compression, uh, which has the goal of reducing the memory requirements of these machine learning models by reducing the model, the, um, the memory required to store these weight matrices where most of this memory is tied up in. And this will be the main goal of most of this talk. Uh, and another, uh, yeah, so the goal will be uh, to preserve uh, performance uh, while, uh, while reducing the memory requirement, uh, but we'll also uh, hope to be able to get these high performing compressed models without training a large model first. Uh, so, and another, another goal will be able to obtain performance and speed, uh, although this will not be the focus of our talk, but often model compression methods can also lead to uh, improvements in how much time it takes to, to train a model uh, and to deploy a model. Uh, so some uh, generic compression approaches, uh, at least most popular ones, uh, include sparsification, uh, which is you remove unimportant entries uh, in these weight matrices and make them sparse. Uh, you can factorize these weight matrices into products of smaller matrices. A uh, popular approach is to reduce numerical precision used to store weights. So uh, already most people use uh, float precision instead of double precision, but you can go even further uh, to float 16. And lastly, uh, there's an approach called distillation in which you use a large model first to try and train a small model uh, to be more effective. So basically to use this in practice, uh, but to train this one first. Uh, so this won't satisfy our kind of bonus requirement of uh, trying to not train a large model, uh, but at least you'll get a small model that you can use on your edge device. Uh, so in this talk, we'll mainly be focusing on the first two approaches. Uh, so quantization, for example, is also very effective, but it can basically be used in conjunction with either of these, since both of these uh, have, are dealing with real numbers and you have to uh, store them somehow so you can quantize. Um, and then at the end, we'll also uh, talk a bit about how you can combine factorization and distillation in, in, in an interesting way that's been used recently. Uh, so currently, sparsification approaches to pruning are probably the most popular ways of producing number of model weights. Uh, and kind of here, the, the way you do this is you run your usual uh, training routine. So you randomly initialize your uh, weight matrix uh, and you run some optimization algorithm to fit your training data. Uh, and then you pick some compression rate, for example, 10%, and you prune. So you remove all the 10% of the weights according to some rule. And usually this rule is magnitude. So uh, make the smallest entries zero uh, and keep only the largest entries. 
Uh, and you can actually do this uh, with fairly decent performance. So in CIFAR-10, which is a very uh, heavily studied image classification benchmark, uh, which is just uh, uh, 10 classes of images such as airplanes, you can uh, get pretty good performance. So uh, barely any loss when you go from the original model to a prune model. Uh, at the same time, you get a tenfold reduction in storage cost. Uh, but we still have to train the full model before printing, so we haven't really reduced the training cost. And, uh, but it turns out this might not even be necessary. So uh, there's a very pop recent uh, popular paper by Franklin Carbon in 2019 that shows that if you take these uh, zeroed out indices uh, and you, uh, you go back to your initial and train this from scratch, uh, and as he called it, these zero indices of lottery ticket initialization. Uh, you can train from scratch and uh, fits, yeah, fit the sparse weights to your training data and obtain a new uh, model which has the same size as this. Uh, but, uh, and you lose a bit of accuracy, but you never actually, uh, at least starting from here, you never actually had to train a full model uh, from scratch. Uh, so you only had 10% of the original parameters during training. Uh, so this is pretty remarkable. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't really solve the problem because the existence of lottery tickets uh, shows that you don't need massive parameter counts. But uh, to actually find a ticket, we must first train in an uncompressed model. Uh, and so actually guessing uh, these uncompressed models uh, have had pretty much success. So on this plot, I'm showing uh, kind of this original model, which required full model training in black. Uh, and then these uh, methods that require still require full model training, but at least you get a small model after pruning or uh, retraining in kind of this dotted black and blue. Uh, but actually guessing these tickets does uh, see now a large drop in accuracy. Um, and also another issue is that sparsity methods are not GPU friendly. Uh, and so uh, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, modern frameworks don't uh, have implementations for sparse operations on GPU. Uh, and so you don't really get any memory or speed benefits on GPUs uh, using these sparsity based approaches, basically any of these. Uh, so in this talk, what I'm going to try to convince you the right approach uh, to compress model training is, is to replace uh, weight matrices not with sparse matrices, uh, but with matrix factorizations, uh, which are products of smaller matrices. Uh, and this is a classical approach that has gone uh, somewhat overlooked in the excitement around lottery tickets. Uh, but we can introduce a simple principled optimization routine for training these factorized models uh, by studying how, uh, how to train unfactorized models. Uh, in particular, we introduce uh, an initialization and a regularization scheme uh, it allows us to train these low rank models uh, to as high an accuracy as printing uh, at the same compression rate and uh, with the added benefit of it being uh, GPU friendly and so on. Uh, and in the second half of talk, uh, I'm going to look uh, at two applications of these schemes that we developed just for low rank factorization uh, that apply to models other than, uh, other than, or apply to use cases other than low rank factorization. Uh, so specifically to knowledge distillation uh, using uh, overcomplete factorization, so uh, the opposite of lower rank, where you actually increase the size of the matrix. And we'll discuss why you want to do that later. Uh, and uh, finally, I'll uh, show some results also on uh, better optimization methods for state-of-the-art sequence models such as transformers, which result from our uh, analysis of factorized layers. Uh, so before moving forward, uh, I'll pause here for uh, if anyone has any questions. Okay, great. So let's start with, uh, with how to train factorized layers and uh, how to do this for model compression. Uh, so we're dealing with these uh, neural network models, uh, which uh, you take an input, such an image of a frog, you pass it through a bunch of weight matrices uh, and nonlinearities, uh, and then you, uh, you have a classifier uh, that will tell you whether, uh, what label it is. So hopefully it's a frog after you've trained it. Uh, and the key component of uh, these neural networks are these, uh, are what are known as layers, which we can uh, call basically functions G of W and X, uh, which apply a weight matrix uh, or a function defined by a weight matrix, which is G, uh, to some intermediate layer input X. So at the first layer, it's just this image of a frog. Uh, and here uh, it's going to be an image or this transformed image of a frog. So after you've uh, multiplied by a weight matrix and pass it through nonlinearity, you'll get some other uh, image like input maybe, and you'll pass it uh, on and on through your weight matrix until you get to a last layer. Uh, so in the simplest case, uh, these layers are basically just linear layers. So uh, you can uh, make this into a vector uh, and just do a matrix product with uh, W times X. Uh, and if W is M times N, uh, this requires o order M times N space to store in memory and order M times N time to apply to an input. Uh, another important layer is this uh, 2D convolutional layer, which is often used in computer vision. 
Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but convolutions basically sum up uh, weighted combinations of 2D inputs, uh, such as images, uh, in a k-by-k -K input window, uh, and they're going to do this c-squared times. Uh, so in this talk, I'll mainly refer to uh, linear layers uh, when I'm talking about uh, layers, uh, but most of what I'm going to say can be also be applied to convolutional layers if you uh, flatten uh, their weights. So their weights are used to define these uh, different filters, uh, and then uh, you get like a kind of a ck by ck matrix, uh, which you can view as kind of the dimensions m and n here. Um, and the reason you know I mention this is because you know, convolutions are very important for computer vision problems, and most of the models we're going to be studying do involve convolutions. Uh, but it's sort of easier to talk about linear layers. Uh, Misha, so you do get significant savings even for CNNs. Uh, yes, so CNNs can also be factorized. Uh, so a 2D convolution can be factorized as two 1D convolutions. Uh, I'll mention this yeah, later. But yeah, you get uh, yeah, you get the same savings basically. Yeah. So yeah, there are two approaches. Uh, kind of main approaches to reducing the number of model parameters if you have a starting model. Uh, so as we discussed, one is sparsity. Uh, so this involves just zeroing out most of entries of W. Uh, so so and this gives you order, a uh, number of non-zeros, time and space. Uh, and then there's uh, another approach that we'll focus on, which is uh, rank K factorization. Uh, so here you transform your uh, matrix W that defines your layer at first uh, into a product of matrices, uh, which we'll generally, generically denote as U times V transpose, uh, where U is uh, M times K matrix and V is an N times K matrix. So uh, multiplied out, they'll get you your original W is an M times N matrix, uh, but uh, storing them if K is much smaller than uh, M and N uh, can be much cheaper. So specifically, you can store it in K times M plus N time or M plus N space, uh, and you can apply uh, this layer, once it's a linear layer, in order uh, K times M plus N time as well. Uh, first, you apply V transpose to your input, which uh, takes time K times N, uh, and then you apply U times uh, the output of that, which is uh, K times N. Uh, so you save both uh, time and space um, by using this rank K factorization. Uh, and you can, yeah, and you can also save both uh, using a sparsity approach, but uh, again, dense matrices are generally easier to work with. Right, so from an implementation standpoint, yeah, these sparse, matrix, sparse matrices are great. Uh, we only have to store and deploy uh, dense matrices on GPU, uh, which is very nice for training uh, and also for deployment to some sense. Uh, and yeah, as I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can uh, factorize convolutional layers as well. Uh, and this is uh, critical to do for applications such as computer vision. Uh, and basically the way you can do this uh, is you can, uh, yeah, or at least one way, there are several ways you can do this. So you can use tensors, for example, but uh, using uh, matrix-based approaches, you can uh, flatten the tensor that defines uh, the weights of your convolution, uh, factorize it in uh, U times V transpose. And what this is equivalent to is uh, kind of a convolution, uh, like a full 2D convolution, uh, can be then transformed into two uh, 1D convolutions uh, that are going to be much smaller, and you get uh, the same times, at least asymptotically, you get the same uh, times of uh, speed and memory improvements. Uh, the issue uh, with uh, factor factorized layers is that uh, you do get lower accuracy than sparsity-based methods at the same compression level. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so in this plot, we go back to our uh, CIFAR 10 example, uh, which, as you might recall, is image classification. And here, uh, you do see a more substantial drop from at least these lottery ticket based approaches uh, compared to training a low rank uh, model from scratch. Uh, and this holds regard, uh, this holds, so here, uh, this is an example of training, uh, yeah, training these low rank models from scratch. But this also holds if you, for example, um, train a full model, uh, so get 94.5 accuracy, and then uh, factorize it after using something like SVD, uh, you're actually going to do quite a bit worse than this. Um, so it's not as easy as printing, uh, which turns out you can do just from your fully trained model. Um, so it is better than guessing tickets, but unfortunately it doesn't uh, get to the same accuracy as uh, pruned models. So, so Misha, the, the, this plot is all for SVD based uh, finding of the lowering factors or some other way? Uh, no, so there is no SVD. Here, there is actually no SVD yet. Here, we basically just start uh, our network training with two matrices okay, okay. U times V transpose, uh, and we train from scratch. Uh, yeah, so if we train a full model and do an SVD there, it actually is quite a bit worse. Uh, I don't have the numbers, but uh, I've tried this. But, but what if you like train a full model and then do a low rank approximation with some other loss function? Uh, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think so. That's uh, I think people have tried this. Um, I don't have precise numbers for you, uh, but uh, in general, it seems that that approach also does worse. Um, or at least, uh, I guess you could interpret what we do as that approach as well. So I could be getting into that later. Uh, but I think there are other approaches that uh, do uh, the worst. Um, I guess it depends on what exactly uh, what exactly you're proposing. I just meant some loss function that might try to favor heavy items more because that seems to be what's uh, what's important. But but yeah, maybe this maybe you'll get into this later. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, we'll uh, we'll be modifying the loss to some extent uh, in order to train this, uh, and that will lead to improvements. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, so we're, yeah, so we have, uh, we have these kind of uh, great method from an implementation standpoint, uh, which is using this factorization. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, at least so far, we've seen that it doesn't do as well uh, as sparsity based methods. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these uh, papers, uh, you know, lottery ticket has made uh, sparsity based approaches very popular. A lot of these papers actually just ignore it and assume that it's going to do worse. So this is at 10% uh, compression. Um, and it does actually, uh, performance does drop actually for uh, more compressed models even further uh, for lower rank methods, like the comparison is worse. Um, yeah, so uh, our goal kind of will be to avoid, avoid this issue while using this kind of more implementation friendly method. And to improve the effectiveness of this factorization approach, we're going to look at the way uh, we train these networks uh, in the unfactorized setting. Um, and to, to do this, as many of you might be familiar with, uh, what we're going to do is initialize uh, weights, uh, these weight matrices. So individual entries are usually initialized from some scaled uh, independent Gaussian variable. Uh, and usually the scaling will depend on the dimension of W. Uh, and uh, we then specify some objective function consisting of two terms. Uh, so we have uh, a loss term, which is high when the training data is misclassified and low otherwise. Um, and uh, the second is this regularizer term. Uh, and the point of this is to make sure that the norm of W isn't too high. Uh, and usually it's some scale or lambda multiplied by uh, the squared Frobenius norm of W. And it's also often called weight decay uh, because it makes the weight smaller. And people have found this to be very important for training. Uh, classically, it's also uh, generally understood to be important for sample complexity, although these days that's been uh, thrown a bit into question. Uh, but yeah, it's been uh, this weight decay approach uh, is very important, especially for convolutional networks. Uh, and once we have this objective, uh, we basically just apply gradient descent. Uh, so we take this function f, we take its gradient uh, or the gradient of w with respect to, or the gradient of f with respect to w, uh, and we subtract from our w uh, this gradient multiplied by some learning rate. Uh, and this is a very, very simple uh, algorithm uh, that tends to work very well uh, in practice. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, I guess, is a caveat that step size can vary across uh, iterations, but that's not going to be very important for us. Um, and these optimization routines have been very heavily tuned for these unfactorized models. Uh, so our goal will be uh, to not diverge too far from these settings when doing factorized training uh, if we want to obtain the same uh, performance. Uh, so we'll see how we can do that in the next few slides. Right, so first we're going to take a look at how we actually initialize these factorized layers. Uh, so as we saw in the previous slide, we usually in initialize W using uh, IID Gaussians, and the default approach is to also initialize U and V using IID Gaussians as well. Uh, so we're going to take, uh, yeah, so all entries of U and V will be uh, sampled from the same uh, Gaussian distribution. Uh, and uh, this seems a reasonable thing to try, but unfortunately yields a completely different distribution uh, when you actually multiply these two matrices. Uh, it could be uh, far away from uh, the actual uh, distribution uh, WIJ. Uh, and the, the reason for this is that, uh, you know, we're doing this low rank factorization. Uh, it's actually impossible for a distribution uh, that's, uh, so to come up with distributions for U and V, uh, such that uh, U V transpose is both low rank. So the inner dimension of U and V transpose are, uh, is K much smaller than M and N, uh, and that U V transpose is IID Gaussian. So we actually can't do this. Uh, because UV transpose is going to, or W sampled from normal distribution is going to be full rank uh, with high probability or with probability one. Uh, but we can do uh, the next best thing, uh, which is uh, get the best approximation to W using its uh, singular value decomposition. So initialize W uh, using a normal distribution. Uh, and then uh, basically 
uh, take its SVD, so get, uh, get its uh, singular vectors and singular values, um, and then uh, set uh, U and V to be uh, U times the square root of uh, singular values, which is a diagonal matrix, and uh, V times uh, uh, singular vectors also times the square root of singular values. Uh, and uh, this basically means that U and V are going to be uh, the best uh, approximation in low rank that you can get to this IID uh, Gaussian matrix. Uh, and we're going to call this uh, kind of a pro-spectral initialization or SI for short. Uh, and I guess one thing to note is that SVD we often view as a very expensive operation. Uh, but uh, the key thing here is that uh, we only have to do it once during training, uh, which is at the beginning. And the matrices we apply it to are not actually that big. So, you know, our models are huge, but they consist of lots and lots of small matrices. Uh, and usually we can actually do this entire thing. So our entire model, we take the SVDs of all these matrices uh, in less than 1,000th the time it actually takes to train a model. Uh, so it's not actually a huge, uh, a huge computational issue to take the SVD of this once. Wait, wait Misha, I'm confused. You're taking the SVD of an IED Gaussian matrix W? Yes. I mean, could, couldn't you just... I mean, the left and right factors are just random orthonormal matrices. So you could just use UV and then orthogonalize yeah. them and then generate the, the, the sigma from like semicircle, right? Without actually... Yeah, you, you could, yeah. Uh, yeah, in principle, you could also do this. I guess our motivation for uh, using uh, kind of this more general formulation, uh, it's not necessarily something we cover in the talk, but uh, in general, people have tried lots of different initializations. So uh, different distributions for initializing these matrices. And we uh, want kind of our method to be the most general. So kind of the principle is you want to simulate the usual training routine. And for some of these distributions, say, uh, you know, difficult to find uh, singular vectors and singular values, um, you can still do it using our approach. Uh, but yes, you're right, you can, in general, like for, for things we know, uh, you could avoid this entirely, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so next uh, we have our initialization scheme. Uh, our next modification is going to be to the regularization and it's also going to be fairly simple. Uh, so uh, as, we, yeah, as we saw before, in general, we uh, penalize the matrix W using its squared Frobenius norm. Uh, so when we factorize the default approach people usually take is to uh, assign the penalty term of uh, yeah, cis coefficient lambda uh, times uh, the sum of the squared uh, Frobenius norms of U and V. Uh, and yeah, so this is the kind of natural approach we can do. Uh, but really the question is what, uh, what does this regularize in terms of the matrix we're actually applying, which is UV transpose. And to see what this is actually doing, uh, we, can, uh, we can look at it as an upper bound. Uh, so in fact, you can, uh, you can show that uh, this sum over the squared Frobenius norms is an upper bound uh, on the trace norm of UV transpose. Uh, so the trace norm is just a sum of singular values uh, and it can be redefined as this minimum over matrices U times V. Uh, and so, and so, yeah, so what we're actually doing by assigning this penalty term uh, is penalizing not uh, the Frobenius norm of uh, the recomposed matrix, uh, but the trace norm uh, of UV transpose. Uh, and, you know, this is fine. Uh, the, the trace norm is uh, kind of all, often used similar to an L1 penalty if we want the output uh, matrix to be low rank. Uh, but we already have this in this case, UV, uh, UNV transpose make uh, are already forcing uh, the matrix to be low rank. So penalizing it further uh, doesn't ex uh, it's not clear how useful this is. Um, and so what we propose to do instead is kind of very, very natural thing of let's just penalize uh, the Frobenius norm of the product matrix. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th it's, this is a very natural thing to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, directly penalizes this quantity of interest and so sort of simulates the uh, unfactorized training routine. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this is actually efficient to compute. So importantly, you know, computing this uh, might take, uh, might take uh, n times n time, uh, but uh, in fact, we don't actually have to compute this. Uh, we, can just, uh, we can just compute the gradients, uh, and the gradients can be computed in uh, k times n plus n time uh, by, uh, by first computing kind of the low rank uh, terms here, uh, and then, or the small terms here, and then multiplying uh, in order. And so we're going to call this approach uh, Frobenius decay, uh, or FD for short. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, kind of the second scheme uh, we're going to use to improve the training of factorized letters. Uh, so we, we have these two schemes, uh, and the question is, um, they seem reasonable to use uh, uh, on their own, and uh, since they're kind of mouthfuls, I will be often, at least in slides, referring to them as SI and uh, FD. Uh, 
but the question is, should we be using them together? Uh, and uh, as it turns out, there actually is good reason why we might want to do this. Uh, so there's some recent work uh, by Zheng and uh, Wang et al. Uh, in 2019 that says that uh, deep nets need regular weight decay to preserve uh, the effective step size of their learning. So if the weight matrix uh, during training uh, becomes too large, then uh, updates, uh, the updates become too small because uh, according to the theory, uh, a lot of uh, modern arch architectures have components that will force, uh, that kind of will ignore the matrix norm except uh, in how large the update is. Uh, and if, yeah, if the update or if the weight matrix norm is too large, then the, the effective learning rate, uh, so how much the weight matrices are updated, become too small during training. Uh, and so they have this plot, so this is from their paper, uh, where, uh, where their quantity of the effective learning rate, which is just the learning rate you actually use, eta, uh, divided by the squared Frobenius norm. Uh, as, uh, as you keep training uh, your model, uh, the weight decay, uh, if you train it with weight decay, your effective learning rate, uh, is around 10 times higher uh, than training uh, your model without weight decay. Uh, and this is kind of counterintuitive because usually we think of uh, weight decay as improving uh, sample complexity rather than, uh, rather than improving optimization. Uh, but in fact, uh, in modern networks, they, it doesn't actually have that much effect on sample complexity because uh, components like batch norm force invariance to uh, scaling. Uh, so yeah, the main thing, uh, but they're still important, and the main reason is for optimization. Uh, and in our work, we conduct a similar approximation analysis to what they do, uh, to show that uh, when you're actually training a factorized models, when you factorize the types of models that they study, uh, this uh, spectral initialization in Frobenius decay will do the same thing, uh, at least at initialization for factorized layers. So they will, uh, yeah, so they will basically, the effective uh, step size at initialization, uh, if you use these components, will be uh, will be larger than if you don't. Uh, so we only show this at initialization because it's difficult to do. Uh, you actually need the, uh, the spectral properties uh, to do this and then uh, they stop holding after your training. Uh, but we find that during training, this is still true. So, uh, so this, this is kind of similar to their plot. We cut the learning rate at different times, but uh, similar to their plot, uh, node, de node decay has a very low effective step size. Um, weight decay, uh, which is in green, uh, has, uh, again, 10 times lower effective step size than uh, applying for a BDS decay like we do. So there's a similar effect uh, going on uh, by using this approach. Uh, okay, and uh, the next question is basically to, uh, whether these schemes actually help. Uh, so let me set up kind of the experimental uh, comparison portion, which uh, we basically focus on comparing directly to these sparsity-based methods. Uh, that are trying to guess these lottery ticket uh, approaches. So this paper from uh, Wang, Zheng, and Gross in 2020. Uh, so we're going to use uh, the image classification tasks they study, which is CIFAR-10, CIFAR-100, and tiny ImageNet. Uh, so these are basically classified images into 10, 100, or 200 uh, different classes. Uh, and we're going to use a ResNet32 model, which is a uh, very popular neural network. The main thing is that it has 31 convolution layers uh, and one linear layer at the end. Uh, and uh, unlike them, so they, they use a sparsity-based approach. They uh, have some criterion for removing entries. And uh, according to this criterion, they set 90% uh, of the uh, entries of the model to zero uh, before training and then train their model uh, and keep those zero dot entries zero. Uh, we're going to do a low rank factorization approach. And the way we're going to do this is to factorize the uh, layers two through 31. Uh, and we're going to determine the rank of these factorizations in the simplest way possible, which is we set a compression target and uniformly scale down the rank uh, of these layers until the target compression rate is reached. Uh, and we don't factorize layers 1 uh, and 32 because they're too small uh, to, for, for a reasonable compression target, such as 10%. Uh, the first and last layers are just too small to get to return anything reasonable. You'll basically get uh, rank 1 layers um, or, yeah, or lower. Uh, so, uh, so we won't be factorizing those, but everything else is kind of uniform uh, scaling down. Uh, and finally, we're going to train these factorized models uh, using spectral initialization and Frobenius decay. Uh, and a key thing is that we don't actually have any more hyperparameters to tune. So this ResNet32 model, there's a standard way of training it uh, using, uh, using gradient descent. Uh, it has standard learning rate parameters, standard weight decay parameters. And all we do is we take, uh, so the coefficient for Frobenius decay, we just use the same coefficient as for weight decay. Uh, and learning rate, we use the same thing. And, uh, and yeah, we don't ha also have no hyperparameters in terms of the rank. So as I discussed, we just uniformly scale down the rank. Uh, it's just predetermined by the compression rate we're targeting. Uh, so we don't have to do any tuning. Uh, 
and yeah, so that's uh, that's a great plus. Uh, so yeah, so to complete the table uh, that we saw before uh, on CIFAR 10, uh, by applying uh, our low rank approach uh, with our two uh, new schemes, we actually uh, beat uh, not only you know, the original uh, low rank approach without using it, but both pruning and lottery ticket approaches. We get very close to the original model. Uh, and critically, on, uh, unlike these two approaches, uh, we, never have, uh, we never have a large model. So these two, model, these two have to uh, train a large model first and then prune, uh, but we don't have to train a full model first at all. Uh, and uh, we get similar performance on CIFAR 100. Uh, so again, we do better. And here, actually, the original low rank approach uh, also did better than pruned uh, model pruning and lottery tickets. But we, again, uh, see quite a bit of improvement. Uh, and similarly, on tiny image net, uh, we get the same thing. Uh, in some other cases uh, that I won't get into, we also uh, improve when you go to higher compression uh, targets. So uh, we have also tested 5% and 2%. And we also uh, see improvements there. Um, one place where uh, we don't see improvement is actually if you use uh, older architectures. So there's an architecture called BGG, uh, and there actually sparsity based approaches are better, uh, but our applying, applying our schemes uh, still uh, shows improvement, at least over uh, the default low rank approach. Uh, and also most state-of-the-art methods are based on the ResNet approach, which is what's shown here. Um, so I, yeah, basically, I think overall these results show that uh, at the very least, low rank approaches should be seen as a strong baseline for model compression, which they're not really right now. And uh, if not actually just the right method to use because uh, they're user-friendly and they work well uh, with uh, you know, state-of-the-art methods like ResNet. So what about the full imaging? Uh, full image net, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't run experiments in the full image net. Uh, those uh, take quite a while. Uh, so yeah, tiny image net is our approximation there. So you don't have any sense of whether the number of classes is important to how well you do. Well, uh, CIFAR 10 to tiny image net is an increase of 20 times the number of classes. So at least here, it seems like, you know, to to that extent, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, for the number of classes in image net, I don't I don't know. Um, the, the one thing is uh, uh, kind of related to your point, um, there, once you have as many classes as ImageNet has, has, you might actually have to uh, factorize the last layer um, in order to get good, uh, good compression, um, at least in terms of model parameters. So that's definitely kind of a good question because uh, then you have to think about, you know, we've been factorizing these convolutional layers, maybe things change uh, in linear layers. Uh, but we've looked at linear layers mostly for uh, transformers, which I'll get into, but not in not for ImageNet. Are there any other questions uh, before I go on to uh, the second half of my talk? Great. So going back to our outline, uh, we've shown how you can train uh, low rank deep nets to match or exceed the performance of. Uh, pruning fully trained ones uh, to the same compression level. Uh, and we can do this in a way that you don't have to train a full model uh, and it's GPU friendly, uh, which is great. Uh, but along the way, we've also introduced these two approaches to training factorized models uh, uh, or training models with factorized matrices. Uh, and this is spectral initialization and Frobenius decay. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, model compression isn't really the only place that factorized layers appear. Uh, so what we're going to look at now is uh, two, uh, two other settings uh, where these schemes uh, can also help, which is distillation and transformers. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, the application to knowledge distillation. So as an overview of what people usually do with knowledge distillation, uh, the kind of the idea here is, uh, you know, before we wanted to train a model uh, that's small during both training and test time, uh, which is why we focused on uh, these lottery ticket approaches, which can train a sparse model from scratch, and our approach, we can train a low rank model from scratch. Uh, but now knowledge distillation, we're going to assume we have a capacity to train a large model, uh, but still want to deploy a small one. Uh, so yeah, to make predictions on smaller devices. Uh, and in distillation, uh, what people usually do is they train a large model, so a teacher model, uh, using the usual training of objectives. So to optimize their data and some regularization. Uh, and this teacher might be a deeper ResNet, for example. So ResNet 110 uh, is just, again, a ResNet, uh, another ResNet, but it's now got uh, three times the number of layers we were looking at before. Uh, and then uh, what, what the people do in knowledge distillation is that they then train a small student model, for example, a model with uh, half the number of layers as a ResNet 110, such as a ResNet 56, uh, using a student teacher training objective uh, for uh, some, uh, so there's some alpha 
uh, some scalar value alpha and zero and one. And what people do is they'll train, uh, they'll optimize the student objective uh, to, uh, to kind of interpolate between uh, optimizing for the data and optimizing for uh, kind of the prediction returned by uh, the teacher. Uh, I guess this W shouldn't be here, but uh, yeah. And then they have, uh, again, also their, um, their, their regularization term. Uh, so yeah, so the goal here is kind of you want to somehow distill uh, distill the knowledge from the teacher uh, to the student. Uh, and because the teacher is, is like this powerful model that usually gets better accuracy, uh, we hope that by, uh, by forcing the student to be uh, like the teacher, uh, we, can, uh, we can get this student model that's much smaller, uh, so small enough to deploy, uh, but still has as good performance as the teacher model. Uh, but yeah, crucially, we do have to train a full teacher model first. So, so just to be concrete, that, so the, the model for the teacher in that formula is the fully trained weight model. Uh, yes, yes. So the W should be the whatever the final weights are for the teacher. Is that right? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, you noted that the slide uses the, this model W, but it's not the same model. It's actually the fully trained teacher model in this formula. Yeah. So here, uh, here, this loss is determined by the difference between uh, what the student uh, student model uh, outputs and what the teacher model outputs. Um, yeah, and it's referring to the fully trained teacher model. Uh, so you train the teacher model first, you get a network, uh, and on an input, it's going to predict something. Uh, your student model is going to predict something, and you use that loss as a difference um, and try to make, uh, make it smaller. OK. So that, that's what should have gone in the place of W on this. Uh, so I think I misspoke. W here is correct, actually. Um, it's just this loss, uh, this teacher loss is um, is, oh, defining, is hiding basically uh, the difference between the what's output by uh, by the teacher network and what's output by the student network. I see, it's a difference. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so knowledge distillation actually does uh, does improve uh, the performance of these smaller models, uh, but it does lead to some headaches when you actually want to uh, want to use it. Uh, so one issue is that the full process has these two training phases. So you have to train the teacher uh, and then train the student. And in practice, this, uh, this nearly doubles the training time. Uh, so if you have twice a, twice a smaller model, um, I mean, it, it still takes quite a bit of time to train, especially since you now have to deal with, uh, deal with kind of predictions of the teacher model uh, while you're doing it. Uh, and, uh, and then again, you have to train the full teacher model from scratch. Uh, so that's one issue. And then uh, the other issue is that it introduces a lot of hyperparameters to your training process, which you have to tune uh, for your problem. Uh, so they're listed here. How, how do you set this interpolation constant between the data and the outputs of the teachers and your objective? Uh, different, uh, different choices of losses and training routines. And actually, which smaller model or larger model do you choose uh, when you want to teach, uh, teach your small model to do well? Uh, so these are all uh, questions that uh, lots of uh, knowledge distillation papers have been trying to address in recent years. Uh, but another trend that people have been doing uh, is a kind of a different approach uh, in which you start with a small uh, student model uh, and you do an overcomplete factorization of its weight matrix. Uh, so again, we're basically going to use this generic weight matrix W uh, and it's N times N and uh, an overcomplete factorization uh, is just the same thing, U times V transpose, uh, except now the K, which is the inner dimension uh, here, is now actually going to be bigger uh, than M times N. Uh, so you actually have more parameters during training, uh, possibly twice as many or even more. Uh, and so this is often called an overcomplete factorization. Uh, and the key, uh, I mean, it's not the key thing, but one interesting thing here is that you're actually not increasing the model expressivity here. Uh, so the number of functions that uh, your neural network uh, can express uh, doesn't go up because you just have this weight matrix W. Uh, you're not, it's still a linear transform. You can't make the linear transform. You can't get more linear transforms out of the same size uh, linear transform at the end. And what, uh, what these papers do is they optimize the original objective. Uh, so they train a teacher, uh, their teacher model, but over these UV transpose uh, matrices uh, to predict. Uh, so this is actually, if you do use Frobenius decay, oftentimes, of course, people use uh, regular weight decay, which doesn't work as well as we'll see. Uh, but 
the key thing is that after retraining or after training, they're going to remultiply the factors to obtain the original small model uh, with uh, weight matrix equals W. So uh, they train using these large uh, UV transpose matrices, uh, and then you can just multiply, uh, multiply once after training, uh, and obtain m times n parameters. So obtain back your small model that you started with. Uh, and so, uh, critically, there's no second training phase, which is great. Uh, you just train a large kind of overcomplete factorization of your small model. Uh, and then uh, the next phase is just one matrix multiplication for every uh, pair of matrices in your network, uh, which is great. So it gets rid of that second training phase. Uh, and most of the hyperparameters are also uh, for that second training phase. And this is really knowledge distillation only in the sense that you uh, train a larger model than you end up with. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're not really the first to study this approach. There have been a few papers that have been coming out, uh, but they've been usually uh, using these weaker non-standard network families, and they haven't really improved significantly over simple uh, student training. So just train the student from scratch in a regular manner. Um, it's really just kind of a proof of concept. Uh, so our approach is going to be to take a res 56, uh, factorize it so that U and V uh, for each matrix W in this ResNet uh, has a second dimension, uh, which is equal to the maximum dimension of uh, W. So this roughly doubles the model size and makes it similar to a ResNet 110. Uh, and then we're going to train using uh, Frobenius decay. Uh, so at least in the standard sense, uh, spectral initialization is not applicable if you go for K even higher than this. Um, you can think about how to apply it, but it's, uh, it turns out easier uh, not to use it. Um, yeah, and uh, so uh, what we end up with is that we, uh, looking at improvement over the baseline, uh, which is uh, kind of the regularly trained uh, ResNet 56 approach, uh, we, we obtain much better performance compared to both uh, the baseline, which is zero here, uh, past over complete methods. Uh, so these methods have been, uh, haven't gotten as much benefit. So they've gotten uh, less than 1% benefit on CIFAR 100 even, and very small benefit. CFR10. Uh, and uh, instead, we do very comparably to kind of the best standard knowledge distillation approaches, uh, which use uh, ResNet 110 teachers. So uh, on CFR10, we actually you know, do twice as well as them in terms of relative improvement. Um, and uh, on CFR100, we do roughly the same, uh, just slightly better. So ours is uh, in this teal color. Uh, and then this last column is uh, the ResNet 110 performance. So actually beat ResNet 110 in both cases. Uh, even though we're training a uh, ResNet 56, our model capacity is at most ResNet 56. Uh, yeah, so the key takeaway is, you know, we can start with this ResNet 56, uh, do an overcomplete factorization of its weight matrices uh, to get a ResNet 110, and it turns out so you can train that 1.5 times faster uh, and uh, perform similarly to a regular distillation approach, uh, but uh, without the complexity of, you know, a second training phase. So before going on to my last uh, portion of my talk, are there any questions about uh, Great. So uh, yeah, lastly, I'm going to look at uh, transformers. Uh, so this is the current dominant approach for sequence modeling problems. Uh, so it underlies uh, a lot of kind of the best known advances you might have been hearing about recently, such as GPT-3. Uh, as well, uh, it's also underlying uh, the recent protein folding breakthrough. So the alpha fold two uh, from DeepMind also uses transformers. Uh, so kind of with, uh, studying these optimi optimization of these models is, uh, is important uh, for uh, a lot of different cool applications that have been coming out. Uh, and yeah, and the distinguishing component of uh, transformers uh, is this multi-head attention layer. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about all the very uh, tricks that people use for transformers. Uh, the key thing is that, yeah, they have this multi-head attention layer, which takes as input a sequence of d-dimensional vectors, so of length t, so the sequence length is t, and then each entry is a d-dimensional vector. Uh, if you're familiar with word embeddings, you can basically view it as uh, kind of, yeah, a sequence of word embeddings. Uh, and what the output of this multi-head attention layer is, is this kind of complicated uh, summation over a bunch of matrix multiplications, uh, which again, also not particularly important what this actually looks like. Uh, but the key, thing, uh, the key thing here is that uh, you have two factorized layers here. Uh, so you can see that you have a bunch of these weight matrices, Q, K, V, and H, and they're all uh, size D times K, where D is kind of the, uh, the dimensionality of uh, each element in your sequence. And you're going to multiply 
uh, you're going to multiply uh, your sequence. Basically, like uh, you just have like a bilinear form here, uh, which is Q times K. But uh, D is usually D is usually uh, H times larger than K, uh, and so you have this low rank uh, factorized layer here. You can actually view this as one matrix. Uh, and similarly, on the output, you actually have the same thing. So V H and O H have the same dimensionalities as Q and K, and again, you get this factorized. Uh, layer uh, in this uh, in this portion. So yeah, as it turns out, MHA is basically just an aggregation of several factorized layer. And so some uh, natural questions that you can ask, uh, given what we've talked about in the first parts of the talk, is can we also improve uh, performance here by applying for BDS decay or spectral initialization? Uh, and yeah, how far can we compress these models by scaling down the rank K? Uh, so we'll take a quick look at what we uh, what we do here. Uh, so to evaluate in the setting, uh, we run some experiments with the BERT model, uh, which is this large transformer model of 110 million parameters. Uh, and the standard way of evaluating BERT is to train it on downstream tasks, just question answering. Um, uh, so there's a squad question answering task where basically you get two questions uh, or get a question and some prompts. And uh, if you match uh, any of the answers that are in uh, the label space, uh, you, you're good and you get, uh, you get a score of one. And if you don't, uh, then your model fails. And so this is kind of a standard approach. You first pre-train uh, this large BERT model on a massive web text corpus, and then you evaluate on some downstream tasks. Uh, so that's also what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we're going to apply kind of uh, Frobenius decay and spectral initialization to uh, these multi-head detention layers. Uh, and it turns out that uh, applying them both also improves performance uh, over uh, the regular training, which is in light blue. So uh, on both kind of the full uh, BERT model uh, and also when you have the dimension of the BERT model. Um, so here we did have to tune parameters because uh, for being decay is kind of the, isn't the default, um, but uh, or weight decay on an unfactored matrix isn't the default, uh, but we do see improvements uh, in some settings of uh, applying for BNS decay, both when we, uh, yeah, both in the original model and when we actually reduce the dimensions uh, of, uh, of multi-head attention. Uh, and what you can also do is, so the transformers also contain linear layers, which I didn't get into before. Uh, and it turns out you can also uh, compress those using just low rank factorization. This, uh, uh, what's important here is that this leads to big improvements in speed uh, by, especially in the linear layers. Uh, and here SI is actually, actually critical. So without it, uh, the factorized model uh, doesn't train at all. Um, it just stays at the same loss. Um, and yeah, so the factorizing this is a very effective way of speeding up uh, the model. Are there any questions on uh, the transformer section before I conclude? Great, so uh, in this talk, uh, we saw how you can basically use popular initialization and regularization schemes. Uh, to make low rank factorization competitive with popular approaches for model compression, uh, including pruning and lottery ticket uh, approaches. Uh, so these methods uh, can also be successfully applied to exciting areas uh, such as knowledge installation and transformer training. Uh, and so in our paper, which will appear at iClear this year, uh, there are several things that I didn't really get into uh, that uh, might be of interest. So there's some further details for the mathematical motivation uh, we discussed before. So how the learning rate, uh, effective learning rate main, uh, stays constant during training. Uh, there's an application showing that these schemes are also helpful when the compression uh, uses tensor factorization, so not just matrix factorization. And it turns out uh, that both of these schemes can also help there. Um, there's uh, applications to when you use overcomplete knowledge distillation, uh, but with three matrices instead of two. So you plop a large square matrix in between them and you can also get improvements there. Uh, and also some more results uh, with transformers, but using uh, on machine translation tasks rather than uh, on, uh, on pre-training large models like such as BERT. Uh, so yes, check out our paper for more details there. Uh, and in future work, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting directions for training uh, both factorized and sparse models. Uh, so we've analyzed kind of these two uh, important components of model training uh, for factorization, such as uh, regularization, uh, and initialization, but we can analyze other things such as dropout and batch learn. We can look at whether, uh, whether there are similar improvements for training sparse networks. Uh, you know, we seem to be able to do a bit of analysis on uh, factorized networks and improve performance. Maybe you can also improve sparse methods. Uh, it would still be interesting, even though I think uh, the implementation benefits of uh, factorized models uh, speak for themselves. Uh, and 
yeah, and we also have this kind of knowledge distillation approach that seems to work well for uh, some vision models. So it would be very interesting to see uh, where, what else they can be used for. Um, and finally, uh, you know, we, uh, we factorized using SVD at the beginning of training uh, using spectral initialization. Uh, there's actually some concurrent work in uh, MLSYS this year that suggests uh, you can uh, train the model for a few steps and then factorize after and get even further performance for uh, these factorized neural networks. Uh, and so, yeah, this is some uh, great concurrent work. Uh, so that, uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk. I've listed some links to our iClear paper, our available code, and uh, uh, some recent, uh, a recent blog we published on this uh, work. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer uh, any further questions. All right. Thank you, Misha. Um, <laughs> is there any uh, questions or comments from the audience? Actually, I, I have uh, two questions, especially about the transformer part. Sure. Uh, I'm still kind of confused why this uh, Frobenius decay is able to improve transformer because uh, when you look at the query and key multiplication, right, mm -hmm. unlike the low rank Ks, uh, the Q and K are usually square or near square matrices because, because of the need to, uh, because of the multi-head attention, right, you need to break it into like, let's say 16 heads, but right. they're usually square or near square matrices. So representationally, they're kind of equivalent to having just like one matrix. Let, let's say you have a W equals to QK transpose. And then what you're doing is essentially uh, having one W like basically functioning as the, this QK transpose and then you're doing a weight decay on this W matrix. So why do you think it makes such a huge difference to factorize it as query key transpose and then use the FD method on it? Right, so, so you're right that uh... In practical implementations, what people do is uh, they ignore that you have lots of, or at least at first, they ignore that you have a lot of heads, and then they multiply it by a square matrix, uh, multiply the inputs by square matrices, and kind of, uh, uh, and then multiply, and then separate them into heads. Uh, but I kind of disagree that uh, they're almost square matrices. I mean, H is usually like when you when you actually uh, separate out the sum, uh, then uh, then k is uh, usually dimension d over h, uh, right? And h can be four or eight or something. So you do multiply it first by a square matrix, uh, but then you end up with a low rank bilinear form here and another low rank bilinear form here. Um, and, and at that point, basically, um, it's, uh, th at that point, you do have a low rank uh, matrix. It's also unclear that uh, low rank is kind of the critical component of why our method works. Um, right, because for example, in the overcomplete case, we saw that our method also led to improvements. Um, actually, there the improvements I think were possibly even more dramatic. I didn't show a comparison with weight decay, but uh, they're they're actually uh, quite a bit bigger. Um, so it's also unclear if kind of the low rankness is what's important, rather than you want to just regularize the product rather than uh, the individual terms. Um, I guess as a kind of note that might be of interest to you, uh, it actually matters more that you regularize this using Frobenius decay than this. Uh, and the reason we suspect is because this is kind of um, kind of the theory that we developed to explain why you want to apply Frobenius decay uh, is based on batch norm, um, and batch norm kind of, and at least the layer norm that's using transformers kind of more directly applies to this than the uh, than this, which is faster softmax first before uh, before being uh, kind of normalized. Uh, but yeah, so I guess yeah, my, in answer to your question, I think it's it's unclear that you actually want or that you should actually need. Uh, low rankness to for the, our methods to work well here. Sorry, uh, what what do you say is the how how is it related to batch norm in this case? So so the reason that uh, the reason kind of this recent theory that says that uh, weight decay preserves the effect of step size is because batch norm uh, forces it to uh, batch norm basically makes your network scale invariant so. Uh, so it no longer affects regularization, but it, now it affects your effective step size. Um, and so, uh, and the reason this works is because uh, the batch norm is applied to a kind of a linear, uh, a linear layer. So linear, out, linear matrix multiplied by your input. Uh, so this is similar to what's done here. Like after the softmax, you pass it into a layer norm, uh, which is, uh, which basically the similar thing holds in terms of scale invariance. Uh, and you can, uh, you can roughly kind of get a similar uh, optimization performance. Uh, 
Um, this is imprecise, of course. Okay, then it should like basically also hold, I guess, across all of the other kind of normalizations, right? Like instance norm, group norm. Um. Uh, yes, of the, at least layer norm, I think group norm and batch norm, uh, I haven't heard of instance norm. Uh, so I, okay. can't, I can't tell you for sure, yeah. Okay, all right. But basically any, any, uh, anything that makes the network invariant to the norm of the matrix. Cool, thanks. Um. Can I ask a conceptual question about the knowledge distillation part? Sure. Um, so in part one of the talk, I think the motivation was really like, look, we want to be able to train like, you know, a sparse but expressive, you know, a sparse but good model. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to avoid the sort of cost of training a larger model in order to get there. But in the knowledge distillation approach, it seems like you're sort of doing the opposite thing, right? You sort of want a sparse or small model ultimately but you're actually training a large model, larger model that is mm -hmm. not necessarily more expressive, but is larger first. And so I was wondering if just from a kind of, if you could help just clarify that from a bit of a conceptual perspective, sort of given sort of the, the motivation given the beginning, like why would you want to, to do this, to train like a larger parameter, but not necessarily more expressive model in this scenario? Right, so, uh, so there, I mean, the reason why is because it seems like uh, more parameters, regardless of whether you get more expressivity, uh, do seem to help your model. Uh, and you're right, it, uh, it does go against, uh, yeah, one of the motivations of, uh, yeah, the first part of the talk, which is uh, kind of train uh, model compression, but also training time, uh, kind of compressed model training. Um, yeah, but basi basically the reason uh, we also, uh, we also looked at this is because uh, kind of we developed these, uh, these schemes for factorized models that seem to work for compressed model training. Uh, but there's all, you know, other also venues where you can uh, where you get factorized layers, including in kind of when you uh, when you scale up the factorization rather than uh, do it in a low rank sense. Uh, and since uh, this seems to work well, uh, yeah, it, it seems like a reasonable application. Um, but yeah, the motivation for actually doing this is yeah, you have a lot of capacity uh, to train a large model, and then uh, you uh, and then yeah, you you want but you want to kind of deploy on say a cell phone or a self-driving car, uh, something that doesn't have a lot of compute, uh, you want to deploy uh, your original small model. And then you want to use something like, uh, like this. Um, why, uh, why this like no more expressivity, but lots more parameters approach helps. Uh, it's kind of a mystery. I think uh, like this paper by Aurora Khan and Hazan, uh, at least in like the deep linear network, says something about uh, optimization, uh, but it's unclear if uh, if that says re that really explains kind of why this is good for generalization. Um, so that's kind of an open question, uh, but it's definitely very interesting that you can get this. Yeah, that helps clarify. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, Michael. So uh, you're comparing, uh, I mean, pretty general approaches like lottery tickets uh, and um, your method, for example. So. Do you have any idea how uh, you compare against networks that were built to be factorized, like mobile nets, um, in terms of accuracy or uh, training speed? Uh, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't looked directly into uh, yeah the comparison to a mobile net. Uh, no, I guess that's the uh, the short answer. Our, our goal really was to compare directly to um, the approaches people have been using for. Uh, like the places where people at least seem to think that sparsity based approaches work well um, and basically show that it's not actually the case that factorized uh, layers can't work well there either. Um, but yeah, so we didn't compare directly to uh, the mobile net setting. Okay, thanks. In the first part of the talk, you mentioned that there were no hyperparameters to tune, but uh, can you remind me how do you pick K? Uh, so yeah, so the rank K uh, is picked. I, I assume you mean the rank. Uh, basically, yeah. you uh, you have uh, you have a target compression rate, such as ten percent, uh, and then what you do is you take all your all the matrices of your model, um, and uh, you factorize them, uh, and then you basically scale down uniformly uh, by basically the same scaling factor applied to the largest dimension of each weight matrix until you reach your compression target. Um, does that make some sense? I see, I see. Um, 
if, if interested, there has been actually a paper in uh, CVPR in last year where they uh, learned what rank to use while training uh, for each matrix. So you can maybe improve adaptively while doing this. Uh, yeah, they, uh, that approach used kind of also used distillation while training. So they did have to train a large model first, however. So there's that issue. Yeah, I guess that was the, so, so, so in your approach, it's the same K for everybody so in some sense, right? Uh, it's not the same K, but it's the same scaling of K, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not clear whether that's the right thing to do or not. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not clear. And you, can, you could, uh, in, principle, uh, in principle, learn it, um, yeah. Uh, Misha, regarding the uh, the use of adaptivity here um, in the sparse based approaches, uh, does adaptivity help there? Like you train a few rounds, you learn uh, you know heavy sparse coordinates, and then you focus more on them and and, and repeat. Uh, yeah, so there's methods uh, basically uh, called dynamic sparsity methods, uh, where you can uh, where your sparsity kind of your mask uh, that you apply to your matrix changes. Uh, so those methods do exist. Um, to my knowledge, they don't do better than pruning. Um, so these methods kind of still attempt to do low uh, kind of compressed model training so that you have a small model while training. Um, so uh, so they, they don't kind of uh, go uh, all the way, like they, don't, they never allow you to have a full network. Um, but yeah, they can change like where the entries, where the zero entries of your matrices are. Uh, yeah, and so those exist, but they don't do better than pruning um, like at the end. Uh, I, they do. Uh, they do better than uh, these guessing tickets approaches. Uh, I guess because they're kind of a strict generalization, uh, to some extent. Another question I had was about uh, you mentioned uh, using tensor low rank approximation. That you're looking into that in the future directions, or you've already done some of that. Like what? Yes. Uh, what are you doing there? Uh, yeah. So you can. Uh, yeah, so we've we've looked at this, and this is uh, yeah results in our paper. Uh, basically, you can uh, you can do the you know these uh, convolutional layers are we flatten them into matrices in this uh, in this talk, but they're actually tensors, right? You have uh, number of channels by number of channels by uh, kernel size by kernel size tensors, uh, and it turns out that you can uh, you can apply various types of tensor factorizations and also uh, do pretty well here. Uh, so specifically, we looked at uh, the tensor train uh, factorization uh, of these matrices, and uh, basically, uh, and tensor train specifically, uh, it kind of has this disadvantage that you can't uh, that to actually apply the convolute layer, you have to remultiply uh, the like you have to expand the tensor train decomposition back to its original tensor. So you don't really save anything in terms of um, in terms of uh, kind of you know compute uh, compute runtime. Uh, but that also means basically you can comp compute the Frobenius norm and apply Frobenius decay, uh, and it actually does help there as well, um, as does kind of our, the version of spectral initialization there, where you uh, where you initialize as a Gaussian and take the tensor train of that Gaussian. Um, but yeah, so that's basically what we've been looking into, uh, and it does yeah. So these schemes also seem to improve uh, performance there. Um, do they significantly improve upon just flattening and thinking of everything as matrices? Um, in the, to get extremely high compressions, like 1%, uh, you need, uh, or at least from what I've seen, uh, you need, uh, you do need to use tensors at something like 6%. It's better. It seems better to use low rank factorization. Um, yeah. I see. I think, uh, low rank factorization actually also is, a. You can express it as a different type of, I think, Tucker possibly tensor decomposition. Um, like when yeah. you, like the whole process of flattening basically gets you also a decomposition of some kind. Right. You could use higher order SVD of you, I mean, for Tucker yeah. type stuff. I don't know if it's helpful here. Yeah. 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 I haven't looked at that, but yeah, I think uh, in principle you could. Yeah. Well, I guess one other question is, uh, I guess, I mean, sparse plus low rank, this is the usual next step. I mean, is this, uh, is this right? Uh, so yeah, I haven't not looked at that. Uh, I think it's, 
I think, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't know how it would work. I think, you know, you would probably want to uh, compress to uh, or factorize to a slightly lower or higher rank than uh, we're currently doing and maybe sparsify. Um, and maybe, maybe that would lead to some improvements. Um, but I, in terms of practice, I'm not sure because, uh, yeah, you want to train on GPU um, and yeah, the sparsity wouldn't, uh, wouldn't help there much. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly something to try. I think, uh, I think the main kind of combination people use is really quantization. I think people use that with both sparsity and uh, lowering factorization because it's very simple um, and it, it helps training time as well. Like on, uh, yeah, on GPUs. Thanks. Were there any more questions? Yeah. Any more comments, questions? I guess in your setting, it doesn't make sense to do any sort of fine tuning after sparsification. Um, um, fine tuning after sparsification? Yeah, like uh, further round of training. You know, after you, like classic sparsification techniques, you know, even, even I guess quantization techniques, mm -hmm. sometimes it's useful to then run a few more training rounds, right? Just to fine tune. Uh, right. Uh, and even I think when people try to do like SVD of fully trained networks, people also do some fine tuning there. Um, yeah. We haven't looked at uh, actually doing that, uh, but that, yeah, that is reasonable to try. Uh, I haven't seen that give much improvements. Uh, I think people seem to uh, get just good results from just pruning alone. Okay. Any other questions? I think we're kind of uh, running out of time already. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, if not, uh, let's thank Michelle again. I'll